All right. Hello and welcome, everyone. Um, today I have Pat Flynn with me. Uh, Pat and I are actually going to be doing a thing where we're recording for two hours right now. And the first half of this will be up on my channel and the second half on his channel. So check out the description for a link to um, his uh, the second half where he'll be um, interviewing me. But for this half, I'll be interviewing him on his book. Which I think it's called uh, The Best Argument for the Existence of God. I think that's right. Maybe just the best argument for God, but honestly, okay, it's, yeah. been, it's, it's been a while since I've looked at my book. So <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> something in I that neighborhood, a, right? Yeah. You sent me a PDF copy and the uh, cover isn't on it, but I can show the um, praises for you, a whole bunch of praises from different people. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, this is a really interesting book because I think you do a very good job of taking these complex metaphysical arguments and actually explaining them in a way that's understandable for someone without any background in philosophy at all. You know, I think we sometimes shy away from like contingent, because it's really a contingency argument, which is the core of your book. Yeah. And I think we shy away from that sometimes to the average person. Um, even though I think it's really, as you point out, it's the strongest argument we have in our toolbox for the existence of God. Yeah, certainly one of them. So a few things. First, thank you. That's very kind, all those words. Um, I really wanted this book to be in the spirit of Mortimer Adler, and if people who know who Mortimer Adler is, he's one of my favorite thinkers and, and philosophers, himself a, a very late in life convert to Catholicism. Uh, but he always was able to write in a way that was both rigorous and accessible. And when it comes to a lot of works, especially works aimed at a popular audience, you usually find that there's a, an expense of one for the other, right? Some, some works are quite rigorous, but they're just not very accessible for most people who aren't coming in with some sort of philosophical or theological training. So they don't, they don't do a whole lot of good, I guess. Uh, but probably worse are the books that are very accessible, but just <laughs> very poor, right? <laughs> They're not very rigorous. The arguments are, are weak. And sometimes, you know, the, the opposition is, is totally mischaracterized. And those books are definitely worse. So for me, it was it was a real mission to try and hit that sweet spot. Still definitely, you know, a popular level book. This isn't this isn't a, an academic book, but I, I would like to think that, you know, it would it has some force even among professional philosophers. Uh, but I wanted it to be something where somebody has to be interested, right? They can, is it, this isn't an easy read, but if you are interested and you're willing to work with me, I think we can successfully guide you through some some pretty difficult terrain at points. So it's 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 very it's very heartening to hear that. I'm I'm glad that you 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 thought that Gideon because it was kind of like that was my primary objective was to try and hit that sweet spot. As for the argument itself, the contingency argument I think is very strong, but my overall case is a cumulative one. So mm -hmm. the the central thesis of my book is actually responding to what I think is a a pretty interesting argument against the existence of God, and it says something like this: Hey, if two theories explain just as much we should believe the simpler theory. Well, guess what? You know, theism and atheism or theism and naturalism, they're on an explanatory par, but naturalism is simpler. So let's believe that. And my book says, well, hold on, wait a minute. I don't think that's quite right. I think the true story is something like this. Naturalism can only explain some of what theism can, but only when strapped to far greater complexity. And what that lets me do is it lets me sort of line up uh, a bunch of explanatory targets, things that I think a worldview needs to explain. Contingency is one of them. So the fact that things are, uh, you might say, modally contingent, that they're possibly non-existent, they could have not been or they could have been otherwise, I think that theism can offer a really good story for why we encounter this feature in reality, along with lots of other features, uh, features concerning consciousness, rationality, the moral dimension, and even suffering and evil. And I think either in some instances, naturalism has no plausible story to tell, or if it has some story to tell, it's a very, very complicated story. It's it's often contrived and ad hoc and just intrinsically less likely to be true. So I think when you when you add it all up, uh, I, 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 I say uh, quite confidently uh, and provocatively that the scales tip decisively in favor of classical theism. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely <laughs> in that camp, right? Uh, so yeah, so that's the general thesis. And then it just kind of allows me to explore a lot of different territory. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Um, I thought that was interesting how you do have, once you already sort of establish, you know, I, I, I tend to fall much more into these sort of arguing in favor from these classical arguments than we get to God. And now we're certain that him not to like the probabilistic ones as much. Yeah. But it is, I think there is a certain almost more compelling intellectual force sometimes to the probabilistic ones than there is to the certainty ones. Yeah. Well, let me, let me speak to that for a minute. Cause that's, yeah. that's, that's something where, where, I guess I'm I'm trying to build a bridge between these two camps, right? So if people are into natural theology, they realize there's kind of two tribes, more or less, right? Mm -hmm. One tribe is the kind of old school philosopher who's into philosophy of nature and metaphysics. And what they're doing is they're out in the field, carving reality at its joints, kind of figuring out, you know, like what are the necessary conditions for really obvious phenomena like change or compositeness mm -hmm. And then through a sort of deductive chain of reasoning, you get to, to some being, a being that is absolutely simple and unchanging, that is itself the necessary condition for all that other stuff, right? Those are mm -hmm. metaphysical demonstrations. And the idea there is you're starting from, again, some experience of the world that is effectively undeniable, like that change occurs or that there are composite beings or that there, there are contingent beings or what have you. And then, yeah, through a chain of, of deductive reasoning, you get to a being that is appropriately called God because it fits a certain definite description, right? And this is supposed to give you metaphysical certainty because that chain is so tight and it's based off of something that is effectively undeniable, right? I'm very, very sympathetic to that approach. And in fact, I, I think that there's several successful arguments for the existence of God that are in, uh, in that school of thought, right? The only problem is that for... A lot of people, uh, it involves a lot of complex metaphysical <laughs> mm -hmm. theorizing that is, one, hard to grasp, and two, controversial, right? So I think, mm -hmm. like, like for example, a number of those arguments are only going to run if you hold to, like, an Aristotelian constituent ontology. And guess what? That isn't, that isn't the only, you know, ontology on the philosophical market, right? So you got to battle that out to get those arguments to run there. We might say that those metaphysical demonstrations that give you metaphysical certainty are system dependent. They're dependent on a wider metaphysical system that is certainly open to questioning and controversy. So point being, I think they're good. I think they do give you certainty, but it's not like they're easy by any means, right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, these probabilistic arguments, one might think, okay, they're a little bit more metaphysically neutral starting out. And that's that's not like entirely true, but whatever. Let's just let's just pretend that it's true enough. Um, okay, so we can start kind of uh, instead of just doing a bunch of like in the grass philosophy of nature and metaphysics, what we can do is we can use a, a method called inference to the best explanation, right? And what we do is now we just have like worldviews kind of, constructed independently. Okay, here's my worldview. This is a classical theistic worldview. Here's what I'm committed to at the fundamental level of reality. And over here is a worldview called metaphysical naturalism. And here's what they're committed to at the fundamental level of reality. Now, what's kind of what's approach things kind of like scientists do, right? Let's take our worldview as a hypothesis and see the sorts of things that my worldview can predict, you know, anticipate and explain. And let's compare that to these alternative worldviews and let's see which one uh, is the, is the best overall explanation when we assess them according to various, we might say like uh, theoretical virtues, right? Explanatory comprehensiveness, simplicity, those sorts of things, right? Um, okay. So what are the advantages of that approach? Well, one advantage is it, it, it might resonate a little bit more with the contemporary scientific mind. Like this is kind of how scientists do things, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. obviously not, science itself but it's a scientific way of going about investigation right just hypothesis testing essentially um so people might be like okay that's kind of cool um it 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 is also in a sense i guess a little bit more modest in what you need to kind of uh, assume or defend up front the downside i think there's so accessibility might be an advantage it could build a sort of cumulative confidence the downside is this the downside is you're right. It doesn't tend to give that like strict metaphysical certainty that the other ones uh, do. It gives you a sort of credence or confidence in the likelihood of your hypothesis. And some people might think that that's a defect. It also, I think, has a very potential uh, severe disadvantage of giving you faulty conceptions of God, right? Because remember, you're kind of 
testing hypothesis that you construct independent of a metaphysical system, right? Which means you could construct like a very anthropomorphic notion of deity <laughs> and mm. wind up confirming that, you know, and then you just have like a very faulty conception of God, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that, I think that is a serious problem. So what's my solution? Start with the metaphysics first, which I do in the book and say, okay, this gives us, I think itself a good argument for God. And it also kind of conceptually constrains or clarifies what we mean by God, then take that over into worldview comparison and see if we could pick up additional confirmation. Yes. That's the best solution I have. Uh, so that's what you get in the book, right? <laughs> no, I think that's a good pairing because I have that concern a lot of faulty conceptions of God, you know? Um, the, oh, I'm not a philosophy student, I'm a theology student. And so yeah. my concern with a lot of these questions is sort of what is the philosophical toolbox that we now have when we start doing theology? You know, and that's sort of, that's actually, I think, where a lot of, like, my thoughts have been in the last, like, year or two in terms of my interests yeah. is how do philosophy and theology relate to one another? And so if we're then given this toolbox, which is very limited, you know, by a lot of moder modern approaches to the existence of God, then that significantly weakens things. Like, you'll see, I think, a lot of people come over into we now have probabilistic reason for the existence of God rather than we have certainty from natural philosophy, which then gives us our starting point, you know? Yeah. Um, and also it tends to, I think, treat God oftentimes as just another little component in the world, you know, when we start theology. And I think that's the wrong conception of God. I think it's not merely that one could put in a very anthropomorphic existence of God there, but that you're almost tending to a, I don't like this wording, but sort of being among being ontologies, you know, yes, of God. Yes. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. I'll give you an example, right? So maybe you are somebody who's engaged in this sort of worldview comparison debate and you construct a hypothesis that has an understanding of God, but this God is a limited being and you're aware of that. You think that this is being, you know, actually isn't omni attributed like the classical theist um, understanding of God. The classical theist understanding of God is, is more than being omni attributed, of course, because I think as a classical theist, you're also committed to things like divine simplicity, which we can talk to, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if we want. Um, and then you might say, well, I actually think that this is the right perspective. Why? Because it seems like as long as my being is powerful enough, even if he is an omnipotent, then he can explain all the things that your being can explain that is omnipotent. But now I have a better explanation of the problem of evil uh, mm -hmm. because he's not omnipotent. So he's just doing the best he can and things aren't perfect, yeah. right? So you see, like, in a sense, that sort of, you know, being among beings, that creaturely deity, you know, like essentially a Superman, which isn't the classical or, or I think right conception of God is almost a better fit of the data, right? Mm -hmm. Then the class, so like in a sense, you might be able to confirm that over what I think is the right conception of God. Maybe because then of course, a classical theist is going to come back and say, well, look, this anthropomorphic deity you have, that's actually very complex, right? To have it being limited in power and other things that that really complicates your hypothesis and in ways that invite arbitrary limits, it makes it internally very unlikely. Whereas if you have something that's, you know, just truly omnipotent, no limits, whatever, it's much simpler. But the, I don't want to get into that debate, right? If I don't have to, right? I rather would, this is definitely an advantage of the classical approach where no, the necessary condition for the contingent order, you know, uh, is a being that is purely actual, pure existence itself. It can't be, it cannot be this limited deity, right? So that's, that's, one, I guess, way of illustrating how if you take the latter approach of worldview comparison, you're kind of constructing hypothesis independent of philosophy of nature metaphysics. It could be a real contender, but I think like totally wrong at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So I acknowledge that I do. And and my again, my best solution is just do the best, you know, metaphysics you can, philosophy of nature can first, and then just show like, okay, maybe you weren't convinced by that metaphysical demonstration I gave you. Well, let's just see how, if we can get some further confirmation by bringing it into the worldview debate yeah. arena. So I'm trying to synthesize if that yeah, happens. yeah. I think there is a place for that because we're sort of then seeing, all right, does our one sort of right, we first walk back to our first principles, but then we almost want to confirm or can we actually derive what we now have from our first principles? Because if we can't do that, we probably made an error in our reasoning somewhere along the way, you know? And I think this is 
oftentimes actually a lot of disservices done to say Thomistic or Scotistic over classical approach you want to take natural theology because they're not it's it's not just the five ways for St. Thomas it's then the whole first 26 questions of the prima pars essentially where yeah. he's trying to derive all these other attributes of God he's talking about providence he's, which we're going to talk about later on you have created goodness there you have all these different details that then flow out of his natural theology, the Summa Contra Gentiles, where he works all the way through to demonstrating particular attributes of the natural law and stuff, such as against fornication or other things, mm -hmm. by the end of his line of reasoning, which started with arguments for the existence of God. So it's almost trying to derive from first principles, then, our entire natural philosophical worldview. Yeah, I had a, a substack not too long ago trying to get a thought out that I that I thought was important is that, that classical theism isn't just about God, right? To, to understand mm -hmm. classical theism is to understand a certain paradigm or picture in the world that has, it's really thick, right? It's very, mm -hmm. very rich, right? Like to be a classical theist is to my mind to be a real essentialist, to be anti-nominalistic, right? To hold mm -hmm. at least to some form of moderate, moderate realism, right? to hold to a constituent ontology, to hold to some form of the principle of sufficient reason or principle of intelligibility, right? To hold to a theory of the transcendentals, right? It's mm -hmm. all, these are all the ingredients, right? That are at work, not just to argue for the existence of God, but to make sense of the world in which we inhabit, right? To sort of yeah. pick out its intelligible structure. And then it just so happens that once you work with all that stuff and you and you kind of investigate the, the ultimate source or foundation, the foundation of reality, mm -hmm those principles, you know, do a lot of serious theoretical and metaphysical work to help you understand what the nature of, of fundamental reality actually is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I sometimes wonder, like, what is the best name for us to call what's essentially sort of think of as like the pre-modern worldview, you know? Because it's not... I often, some people say right, connect it with Thomism. There's clearly was even yeah, if you no, wanted to just I, look at Catholics, other ones, right? But I think even if we go to one. say, I, I got one. I, yeah. I think I think it's Big Tent Platonism. That's what Lloyd yeah. Gerson would say, right? And and uh, and to me, big and I'll just follow him right here. I, I I really appreciate what you're saying. It's it's almost understood as like anti everything modern philosophy is. It's anti mechanistic. It's anti reductionist. It's anti nominalist. It's anti skeptical. It's anti relativistic, right? Mm -hmm. You, if you sign on for all that, then you're a big tent Platonist, right? Which Gerson, yeah. Was, yeah, that's Aristotle, that's Aquinas. This is perennial or classical philosophy, right? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It's the only worry I have with the label of Platonist, though. I get it's saying Platonist, not Plato, but I'm almost thinking, you know, we're broader, even I think, in a sense, than Plato. Because there's been a lot of, I think, interesting interaction recently with like Chinese philosophy, looking at classical Chinese philosophy or classical Hindu philosophy, right, yeah. and seeing actually a lot of these same principles come up here. Like this is just how, you know, to us it's so counterintuitive because mm -hmm. we're so influenced. I think, I think especially by um, atomism. I think is really a big mechanism. Are really sort of big things that yes. influence how we've seen the world. Absolutely. That it's hard for us to realize that for like most people in history, ours was the counterintuitive view in that like the big tent Platonism was the intuitive view. Yeah. I, th I think it's the obviously co correct and intuitive view, but you're right. I'm just going through mm -hmm. father James Dominic Rooney's book right now, where he essentially is investigating hylomorphism mm -hmm. in, you know, uh, Eastern thought. Right. So yeah. is, this is definitely something that is not exclusive to, <laughs> you know, um, the ancient, uh, you know, thinkers like Plato or, or Aristotle in that area of the world, or even even Catholics, right? And and that sort of like makes sense, right? And this is this is another thing that I always found interesting about classical theism is that if you do study wider traditions, you see a very strong convergence on on yeah. classical theism, right? You see it in in the Hindu tradition, you know, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, obviously, but among the pagan thinkers too, and you know, that sort of repeatability across different times and cultures. Like, I think that, I think that that's indicating something like the mind mm -hmm. can really like get a grip on reality and it doesn't mean it's easy, but if it tries to work out the implications and necessary conditions, it's interesting that it seems to keep coming to this particular point where there's sort of one foundational thing and it's really spooky. <laughs> right? yeah. I think that's right. Right. And I think some people kind of worked it out with a little bit more refinement than others, but I mean like, dang, right. Like what, what Plotinus came up with is pretty similar to, you know, what, uh, and of course he was influenced by him. Right. Uh, 
the Aquinas and the other scholastics and stuff like that. But you see it even among people who were presumably disconnected in their mm-hmm. thought. And I think that's cool. I think that like repeatability is, is a pretty cool thing to notice. Yeah. Yeah. And you, I want to get that book by uh, Father Rooney. There's another book I saw coming out in a few months, which is actually going through different parts of the Summa and comparing it to different Chinese thinkers. Yeah. Yeah. So what is, what is Father Rooney's? It's, it's, uh, it was, I think it was based off his dissertation, mm-hmm. uh, but it's, I haven't finished it yet, uh, but it's, I mean, it's very good. And if you're interested in um, hylomorphic thought, like w- why is this a, a, an effective system? And, you know, how do you solve some of the puzzles that come up you know, especially in myriology with high laboratism. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a great resource. I would recommend it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, something else with your book I wanted to discuss is your issue dealing with the Odyssey. And we're going to deal more with that. I know in the second section, but mm-hmm. I noticed you embraced essentially a scotistic position on um, the affections of the will. Yeah. So as, as you know, from our previous conversation, I'm, I'm very much inclined to a lot of scotistic thought, especially mm-hmm. when it comes, I think that's exactly what we talked about last time of, especially yeah. when it comes to, to freedom of the will and, and how I think that that, that solves certain issues related to, yeah, e- even within just the, the literature of libertarian freedom and stuff like that, but also the problem of evil. So I'm glad you, you picked that up because that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what? A lot of my work over yeah. the last year has actually been a lot more, I feel like, with actually reading Aquinas than reading Scotus, but I'm almost mm-hmm. reading him with a very Scotistic lens, and I'm finding all sorts of insights in trying to bring Thomas and Scotus together in different ways. Yeah, I, and I've been wondering, too, again, and I'm much more, you know, in the, I guess, the Thomistic tradition than the Scotistic one, although I've really enjoyed and benefited from everything I have read in the Scotistic uh, tradition. I, you know, I, I don't know, maybe this is me just trying to be too ecumenical, but I, a lot of times I don't think there's as much difference as other people uh, insist upon. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the formal distinction is, is kind of like one of those areas Mm -hmm. where I'm not entirely convinced that, that, that they are at odds when it comes down to this. Uh, and we can get into that if we want. I mean, this is a really in-house debate. Yeah. But I but I guess my my position right now would be the one that if you look at my channel and the conversation that I hosted between Gavin Kerr, who's a Thomist, and um Thomas Ward, who follows SCOTUS, is mm-hmm. they seem to think that the, the difference is is really not significant. It's quite trivial yeah. they're on the same page. So yeah. Or maybe they're just totally at odds. I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I think that is the case. And if you look at, I've been reading now a lot of later SCOTUS treatments of metaphysics, and there was internal debates among the SCOTUS, just like there was internal debates, you know, among the Thomists and stuff. And they were all in dialogue with one another. I think it's something very interesting. And when you, re- I remember I picked up uh, Sebastian Du Pasquier, sort of a early 18th century SCOTUS, mm-hmm. who I think what he's very good is he, was trying to basically summarize a lot of earlier Scotism in a way, this was already the beginning sort of of the decline of the school. So he's trying to deal with the fact that people just aren't as good at the stuff as they used to be, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, um, but then I remember I picked it up and I started reading his like first disputation, which is on the subject of metaphysics. And I genuinely didn't even understand like what the question being asked was. And I'm like, and this is supposed to be like the dumbed down simplified version. And this is still a million miles ahead of where most of our discourse was t- is today. I get people will look down on different aspects of like second scholasticism and sort of nitpick the areas where there were genuine issues yes. in their approach to metaphysics. But there's also a lot there. And they were just like way ahead of where we are now. Oh, overall. because it was, I mean, you had the, you had the brightest people working at this for an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. And then of course now, now look where we are, right? You have like mm-hmm. a, a few people in the academy, like trying to pick it back up, of course, right? Yeah, <laughs> of course, it's probably going to be relatively impoverished, right? Which you know makes me a little bit nervous as I'm trying to do some of this work. It's like, man, uh, I'm sure there's a bunch of people I've never even heard of, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that have probably already figured out uh, the issues I'm trying to work out. They would think that it's t- entirely elementary what I'm doing, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, I was reading an article on uh, the history of education in the conventual Franciscan order. It goes up to the uh, mid 17th century. And it's like, we're like nothing. Though. Like They would start around the age of 14 with their thing. And they would spend three years just studying logic before they studied anything else. And they would just study Aristotle's organon from like 
uh, morning till night, like six right. days a week for basically three years straight before they even picked up any other works of philosophy. And they studied three years on the physical and metaphysical works of Aristotle and then spent six years studying the sentences with all the various commentaries in the sentences. And then after that 12 years of seminary education, then they could go out and do other stuff, you know? And it's like, <laughs> there's, there's no start, way we can right? even yeah. get close to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But don't be disparaged, my friends. No. There's, still, there's still good work to do out there, right? <laughs> there is, yeah. Yeah. So so that's right. So I'm I'm uh I, look, when it comes to to Thomas, I think he's I think he's brilliant. I think he's generally correct. I'm by no means like I don't think he's infallible. And mm -hmm. there's there's certain areas where there's you know, there's lots of debate into mystic thought where I think I know what the correct position is, but there's a debate about whether that's Thomas's position. If it turns out not to be his position, then I'll just go with what I think is correct. No big yeah. deal, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there became in this, one of the weaknesses of the second scholastic period was this formation of like schools where people got very rigid around certain people. And um, within, I know among various SCOTUS actually, um, Bartholomew Mastry I mentioned earlier, he goes after, um, John Punch, who's sort of the other big figure in his day, because Punch was willing to defend all the conclusions of Scotus, but not necessarily every single argument that Scotus used for those positions. And so Mastery said he wasn't a real Scotus because of this. Yeah. Well, look, <laughs> yeah, I, I, this is probably of like of, in, of interest to five people at these in really in-house debates, but they're they're certainly interesting to me. Yeah, see the same thing in any school, right? You see the same mm -hmm. thing and how Aquinas's arguments are interpreted and whether you think you know, all of his five ways are sound or maybe only two of the five ways are sound. And like, <laughs> depending on where you come down on, you know, that uh, you, maybe you'll be included, maybe you'll be invited to the, to the party or maybe you won't. Um, <laughs> none of that concerns me. All that concerns me yeah. is, 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 is figuring out what's true, right. To the best that yeah. I can, to the best that I can. Right. Um, so yeah, those, those little, like, I don't know, tribalistic, you know, disputes are, um, they can sometimes be productive, but I think a lot of times they're also just distraction, right? No, mm -hmm. I think so, because I, I generally actually prefer mastery, you know, to punch in his actual arguments, but I just think this is the dumbest argument to take issue with punch at, just take issue with where he's actually wrong philosophically, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's something else I wanted to ask you about with your book, because you mentioned at the beginning that you think the ontological argument can be synthesized with these cosmological approaches, and I very much agree there, Yeah, but you know, maybe I just missed it in your book, but I was curious if you could maybe spell it out a bit more because I didn't see it explicitly. Well, it it, it, it's it's answered in relation. So maybe this will get us into the contingency argument a bit if we want to mm -hmm. talk about that, right? So um, I am, I'm very committed, Gideon, as I think you are. This is one of those mm -hmm. fundamental classical intuitions to the intelligibility of the entire real order, mm -hmm. right? And this is this is the general intuition that the world is fully comprehensible. Maybe not to us, right? Mm -hmm. But intrinsically, right? And what that means is that uh, there is a complete answer to every coherent question that can be asked, right? Mm -hmm. And if you if you think that's right, then I would say you're committed to something like the principle of intelligibility or the principle of sufficient reason, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. the The alternative view is one that that holds that reality is not completely intelligible, that we might get to something that is inherently mysterious. It seems like it needs some sort of further explanation, some sort of reason for its being or its characteristics. But there's 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 no explanation to be found. We might call that a brute fact. In fact, some philosophers mm -hmm. call that exactly a brute fact, right? And there's there's met and honestly, honestly, Gideon, maybe like the, the primary difference between the theist and the atheist is this at the end of the day, yeah. right? And you will see many atheists are just kind of happy to accept the brute fact view. They'll say, you know, I mean, Bertrand Russell famously said it of the universe, right? In his debate with Father Copleston, he's like, the universe is just there and that's all, right? Stop asking yeah. questions about yeah. it, right? That's a brute fact view. Like, it seems like there should be some further explanation, right? Yeah. Of why this thing that has, you know, all these sort of arbitrary uh, limits and, and properties and features. It doesn't seem to be necessary through itself. Like I want to know why it's here. And if somebody just says, be happy with the intelligibility you have, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Stop asking for more. It just is. That is a brute fact position. Not all atheists take that. Some atheists think that you can get, um, a, you know, a, a, a sort of explanation, uh, entirely within the natural order, uh, without, winding up in absurdity. I argue against that view in my book. Yeah. Okay. I promise this will connect with the ontological argument, uh, eventually here. Uh, so what I, what I 
do in the book is I don't just assume that intuition. I, I defend the principle of sufficient reason, at least a, a, a restricted form of it. And I defend it with various different arguments, like, you know, arguments to show if you deny it, you seem to wind up with really catastrophically skeptical scenarios. You can support it through inference to the best explanation. Obviously, it's supported by just common sense and stuff like that. So I give a whole battery of arguments for it, right? And then what I say is, okay, if we're going to satisfy the principle, like, the principle of sufficient reason is true. If we're going to satisfy it, and this is this is sort of the heart of cosmological reasoning, then we need some entity that is capable of explaining absolutely everything. And by that mean, it has to be an entity that can explain all the things in the world, all the contingent things that are inherently uh, not uh, self-explanatory, at least concerning their existence, right? Uh, but also be able to explain itself. All right, now that's a pretty radical claim, right? Because most people think that explanation is something that comes from outside. And I say that's a, the causation is something that comes from outside, not necessarily explanation. You know, you have intrinsic explanation. In fact, the principle of sufficient reason that Thomas endorses that a thing, you know, uh, has, you know, whatever it has, either in virtue of an extrinsic cause or the principles of its own nature, mm -hmm. right, allows for internal explanations where if you can just sort of grasp the intelligibility of something, it removes a certain degree of, of mystery internally, right, according to its own nature. So what I'm arguing is that at, at the end of the day, if the principle of sufficient reason is true, you need to have some really sort of a special entity where if we could grasp its essence, which we can't, there would be no mystery about why no. it exists and why it has the characteristics that it does. And that's a, and, and the ontological argument comes in here because what I say the ontological argument does is it gives you an entity that seems like it could fill that sort of role. Right. Yeah. And but the cosmological argument gives you reason to think that entity actually exists. So that's how okay. I see those two things marrying. Where I, I argue that uh, the theistic worldview exclusively gives you reason uh, to think that there is a a a an, an entity right that actually is capable of reducing brute facts to zero that could explain everything that needs to be explained including itself. And I argue in the book that, that only theism can do that. And the ontological argument can help us see why you need a very special sort of theoretical entity to fulfill that role. Right. Yeah. You see, it seems to me, and I've gotten in a lot of debates with Thomas about this, because it seems that under Thomas's view, this is like very clear in later Thomas, there simply is no, in Aristotle, Aristotelian or propter quid, uh, reason that we could come up with why God exists. Like we can reason to the fact that God must necessarily exist given that we exist. Yes. But in Scotus sort of brings up the concern with this, that we're almost making the existence of God, at least intellectually reliant on things that exist. Because we're almost limiting, we're almost saying that we have to, for it, right, If what if the universe didn't exist? Obviously, God wouldn't need to justify to us that he exists, then we wouldn't yeah. exist to have that. But there almost seems like there has to be a reason still, even if the universe didn't exist, if we want to grant that it could have not existed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the cheeky Thomistic line uh, for ontological arguments is that there there is a sound ontological argument, but the only one who knows it is the one who doesn't need it, which is, yeah. God, <laughs> which is God, right? Mm -hmm. Um so what's my position on the ontological argument by itself? I I just am agnostic, right? I just haven't spent enough time in that area or on that literature to, to fully make up my mm -hmm. mind. I'm hesitant as I tend to be just to go with the Thomistic school, which in you know the overwhelming majority tends to reject uh, mm -hmm. an independent ontological argument. So I remain neutral on that question, I think, in my book and say, hey, this is a cool thing. It's at least worth thinking about. And I don't know mm -hmm. even any skeptic who denies that it's worth thinking about, right? Most people yeah. will admit that this is at least super fascinating, even if they don't think that it works. Um, so what I want to say is it, I'm definitely convinced that there are sound contingency and cosmological arguments. And uh, these... All right, so what's what's up here, right? So the idea of a lot of contemporary modal modal ontological arguments try to move from the the possibility of God to the to the actuality and necessity of God, right? Mm -hmm. Through a through a, a system of modal logic, right? Whereas if you have possibly God exists, you'll get a you'll validly you'll get God exists, right? Mm -hmm. um, the problem comes down to that possibility premise most of the time. You know, most yeah. of the most of the debate goes, well, how do we know that it's really possible that God exists? And you can give a sort of battery of arguments for thinking 
that it is possible and skeptics will give you a battery of arguments for being skeptical <laughs> about it. Right. So, yeah. uh, there's, there's a lot of back and forth over that. And I don't have my mind made up on that yet, but the, the advantage of the cosmological argument is that if those arguments go through, it shows that God is possible because he's necessarily actual as the necessary condition for something that actually exists right now. Yeah. Right. So you don't have that issue of, of just trying to stalemate a possibility premise with cosmological. So you could say, well, because there's a sound cosmological argument, it's possible that God exists. Therefore God exists. But yeah. We don't, we don't need the ontological argument at that point. Anyway, yeah, right. So. right. Um, so yeah, I don't yeah. know. I don't have my mind met. That's a long way of saying, I don't know yet about the ontological argument. Yeah. Right? It I, I do grant that I think that possibility premise is the heart. That's sort of where the atheists would have to go. It almost, I think, forces them into a position where you say you can't be agnostic anymore. You have to draw, you know, aside either God's, you can't say maybe God exists, right? Does that would in, in itself, or you'd maybe say intellectually, maybe, but you can't say actually, maybe, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah and, and then there's, there's, tr you know, there's kind of tricks and I, I'm skeptical of the ones that want to just define God as like the maximally consistent set. Right, where mm -hmm. like you like your just your definition will entail its possibility, but but that doesn't really tell us much, you know, right? Like, is that mm -hmm. really the god of classical theism, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I I I don't put a lot of stock in those approaches, or if they if they prove something, I'm not sure exactly what they prove. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, again, this is not an area that I specialize in. It's fascinating. Yeah. At some point, I would like to spend more time on it. I'd like to spend more time in the contemporary literature. I've read a lot of medieval stuff on it, you know, but then mm -hmm. I looked at like Graham Oppie's book on it, sort of the big atheist book against it. And yeah. I felt he spends a lot of time arguing against modern forms of the argument, which I actually agree have a lot of problems. But when he treated like Bonaventure's view, which is really the only medieval, he treats Anselm and then he treats Bonaventure very briefly. And I felt like he kind of completely missed the point with Bonaventure. Mm. Uh, because Bonaventure is basically taking Anselm's argument and putting it along more rigorous metaphysical lines. Basically, mm -hmm. if God is God, then God has to exist. Yeah. Um, and, he, and he also he develops Anselm's theory of pure perfections to show why it would not apply to the island as well. And I felt like Oppie sort of missed the point on that. So I'd love to see, you know, some contemporary people interacting with the actual versions of the medieval arguments. But I feel like because... This is, and it's almost like we were saying earlier, right? It, it supposes a big set of metaphysical baggage. And I think the baggage here is not hylomorphism or act potency or something like that. It's really the reality of metaphysics. It's yeah. question, are you saying that being, is this just a mental construct we use to make sense of the world or is being a real feature of things? Yeah, well, I'm definitely the latter. And, and Oppie's a smart guy. He's been a heavy critic of ontological arguments. I'm, I'm not familiar with Bonaventure's approach enough to say, but mm -hmm. you mentioned you mentioned the island. This is fun because this is an area I'm not like specialized mm -hmm. in. So it, it's fine if I make myself look foolish, right? Um, yeah, so there's these parody arguments of like a maximally great island or maximally great pizza and stuff like that. Uh, and the notion of pure perfections is in the in the in the classical theist tradition that if we're going to attribute, you know, something of God as as being identical with God, given simplicity, it has to be something that is not inherently bounding. Right. Mm -hmm. So the idea there is, OK, it doesn't seem like the idea of power or goodness or even love is something that implies a limit. Right. Yeah, exactly. Whereas whereas something like curiosity does because to be curious means there's some limit on what you already know right <laughs> yeah so the idea is okay we got to think along those lines and is the i'm asking you now is the idea that if we if we bring in this commitment does does that open up a sort of path where it can block these sort of parody arguments is that is that the direction you're going right yeah i think so because i think then we can say we could basically you could always put one more palm tree on the island Right. I think an objection that was raised to this view, not directly, but sort of came in my mind, was raised by uh, Taylor Patrick O'Neill. I don't know if you know him. Yes, yeah, he's uh, been on my show yeah, before. Mm -hmm. I met him uh, this summer at the Sacra Doctrina conference, and he was arguing actually in defense of the position that this world is the best of all possible worlds. And he brought up specifically... O'Neill was arguing that this yeah. is the, so, so yeah, Atomus so taking Leibniz's line. That's yeah, interesting. <laughs> he argued it that you can't know this by natural reason, but it's revealed by theology that this is the case. Interesting. Okay. So he tries to argue that Thomas holds that 
the scriptures reveal this is the best possible of all worlds. And O'Neill's argument, he's the, the big argument he has to respond to, which everyone is going to raise, like all the Thomas, just go to everyone are going to raise, is this, you could always add one more nice palm tree to the universe thing, you know? One more and his hula, hula dancer, right? Yeah. Yeah. And his answer was that even though each of those individual things might be greater, we have to consider the overall common good of the universe. Yeah. And once you encounter, encounter the interrelations between all things then this is in fact the greatest of all possible worlds because adding some more good thing would decrease the overall ordering of all the things in the universe towards the maximum yeah. good yeah yeah that's interesting that's plausible it's more along the lines of somebody say okay maybe there's not a best world in that sense but there's the best kind of world right mm -hmm. um i think trent doherty proposes that uh in his in his in his theodicy so he thinks that god would go after at least the best kind of world. Yeah. Certainly open to that. I don't think, I actually don't think that the idea of the best of all possible worlds is nearly as like silly as um, Voltaire did for sure. <laughs> right. I think Oh yeah. like Leibniz, you know, the guy who's, you know, well associated with it, like that dude was an idiot. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, you know, it's the metaphysical arguments that there's not a possible best possible world. I think that are much stronger. Um, what I take issue with in a lot of modern framings of the ontological argument, I'm thinking here especially of Plantinga's version, because I think yeah. Plantinga's version is interesting to compare to Scotus's version of the ontological argument, because they're both modal ontological arguments. Right. But for Scotus, there's a whole bunch of possible worlds that could exist. And so we need God as the ontological grounding for the possibility of all possible worlds. Yeah. Versus for Plantinga, God is in all possible worlds. And because he's <laughs> in all possible worlds, he must exist. But that almost, it makes God a thing in the world rather than something outside yeah. the world that serves as its ontological yeah. foundation. Yeah, gr great point, right? These are different ontologies. So I won't drag Plantinga into it personally, but we'll just generalize it, right? So if, yeah. if, you're, if you're like a Platonist about possible worlds, right? You think that these mm -hmm. things are like, have some sort of actual reality to them, right? And yeah. even in like a faded sense. Uh, and you think that when you say that God is in all possible worlds, that he's like, he just occupies all those worlds that e exist independently of God. Yeah, that's, that's a big issue, right? And mm -hmm. I think it's a big issue in the sense that general, uh, this is it's going to sound inconsistent with what we said before about big tent platonism uh but i don't think it is um uh because i think this is just an area where being a platonist is wrong <laughs> right? <laughs> right but i think that's an issue with 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 theism right like i don't think that anything exists independently of god um hmm. abstract uh, possible worlds what have you right i think the best way to think about possible worlds are just expressions of god's power right they're things that god could have brought about. So I think God grounds the modal landscape, right? It's not that God just occupies all of it, right? God is the ground of the modal landscape. A world is possible only insofar as it's something that can be brought about by God. Um, that's the right way, I think, to, to think mm -hmm. about the relation of God and modal. I think that's also the traditional way. Certainly that's the way Aquinas and Scotus yeah. would, would have thought about it, right? Mm-hmm. I think it could very well be, you know, you raise this objection to planning gun. He said, oh, that's what I actually mean, you know. But I just think it's interesting, the wording yeah. of the argument, you know, is supposing a very per theistic personalism approach to the existence of God, you know. Not only that, but if you if you hold, so, I mean, there's kind of like two major uh, ontologies. Uh, there's more than that, but like, I think two major, very interesting contenders of like trying to explain how things have the character that they do familiar everyday objects, right? So you have constituent mm -hmm. ontology, which is very Aristotelian, that, that things have components, metaphysical components, like form and matter. And if you follow Aquinas, essence and existence, substance, attributes, stuff like that, uh, where things are intrinsically structured, right? And this is how we can make sense of, yeah, how things have the character they do, how they endure through change and over time and all that sort of stuff, right? Then there's relational ontology, which is more platonic, where things sort of are more blob like they're intrinsically unstructured and, and they bear a sort of relation to some like form like through mm -hmm. some like you know uh, primitive exemplification or something like that right i think if you're a theist you should you should maybe not go that uh, I, i've seen some people try to want to avoid divine simplicity by taking this um more platonist ontology why is that because i think if you hold a constituent ontology you can run metaphysical arguments for divine simplicity uh, right mm -hmm. uh but i think if you if you take this relational ontology like it's it's kind of like at the end of the day like everything is simple 
right? It's a blob. It's intrinsically unstructured. So like you have a form of divine simplicity anyways, but now God is God because he stands in relation to some form of divinity or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it seems to make God like both simple yet a dependent entity. That's so, interesting. I've never seen that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, uh, I think theists should, you know, choose their ontologies carefully <laughs> yeah. and and i think well i think constituent ontology is just better in terms of its you know a, an overall metaphysical system for actually mm -hmm. answering important questions and i i do think at the end of the day it is what drives to a simple root of everything and it gives you divine simplicity and i would just say yeah i, I know there are theists that are platonists so maybe they would bite the bullet or disagree with me about some of those commitments but it does that does seem correct to me right yeah yeah it's mm -hmm. an interesting paper i think can be brought into dialogue with this actually by sean carroll of all people yeah who um he has a paper he's trying to deal with the issue of how do we have all the complexity we now have in the universe because he wants an evolutionary account of yeah. uh, history and so he actually brings up the example of sort of the basic idea of entropy right mm -hmm. of removing from order to disorder and so he did a computer simulation of uh, you have a glass of like coffee and a glass of milk and then you pour the milk into the coffee and shows that all the complexity appears in the middle of the process but you start with a very simple situation you can know exactly where all the coffee molecules are exactly where all the milk molecules are and at the end you can tell exactly where they are as well they're all mixed up with one another but you have you know if you pour like a cup of milk and a cup of coffee right you see that all these different patterns appear as the milk initially enters the coffee and stuff and so I think we can actually bring this in in a metaphysical way instead. We could say, right, pure potency and pure act are both simple, but they're sort of simple in opposite ways. Mm -hmm. And complexity arises somewhere in the middle between act and potency, you know? Oh, yeah, that's interesting. It's, uh, I only have black coffee here right now, but I'm going to run a, that experiment later and confirm the hypothesis. Yeah, that's good, right? Yeah. And and that's right. I mean, obviously, classical theists are are committed to the idea that God is 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 pure act and you know, simplicity. Sim I have a chapter in my book called "Simplicity." It's it's complicated. It is, and and there's mm -hmm. you know two ways of talking about simplicity. I did I, you know, uh, investigate both in my book. One is the notion of divine simplicity, right, which gets all sorts of people worked up, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's true. And then the other one is like theoretical simplicity or simplicity with respect to like theory comparison and stuff like that. And neither of those are easy to think about, but I think they're both, it's really important that we do think about. Uh, both yeah. Of those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think part of the issue is people are thinking of like the simplicity of something like potency when they're thinking of simplicity or thinking of something that's so simple, it sort of lacks any attributes at all. You know, there's a great passage in this from um, Gary Gould Lagrange where he's talking mm -hmm. about, um, the unchangingness of God. He says, we're not saying God is unchanged because he's inert, but yeah. that he's so fully actual that yeah. there's no change. There could never be a move from potency to actuality in him. So, but it's, so it's the opposite of inert. It's God is so able to move that he doesn't actually move at all, you know? Yeah. So thoroughly uh, complete, right? And yeah. even that language is like sometimes like perfection, you know, think we think of it as like thoroughly made, right? Which is a good understanding of perfection, except for like God isn't something made. So I always want to like, Mm -hmm. careful about that with respect to god but that's right god is just a being of 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 absolutely pure positivity all those you know uh positive perfections that we were talking about before yeah uh which are identical in god right so god just has no higher state of perfection to attain doesn't mean god can't do anything he clearly does right he creates mm -hmm. um but all that change is extrinsic to God, right? It doesn't require yeah. any, anything to like any gear to rotate inside of God when he creates or anything like that. Right. Um, so yeah, those are, those are good points. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's important to understand exactly what is being said about classical theists. And they're not saying that God is just some like static block of ice or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the hardest ones, you know, I found to explain to people is our idea that God is passionless. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I think we have such a psychological concept of what it means to be a person nowadays. Yes, that when you say God is because I don't, we'll often say God is without emotions. But the more mm -hmm. I've thought about, the more I'm like, emotion seems to be a wider category than passions. Almost, so we say yeah. God loves, we say God has wrath. And these are real terms about yep. God that we're actually describing God. Yeah, so maybe no emotions isn't the right word. It's we have to distinguish exactly what a passion is. Then. Yeah, well, first off, why do 
classical theists say that God is is without passion. Well, traditionally, passion just means to be under the influence, the causal influence of something, right? So God yeah. is the fundamental first cause of everything. God causes everything else apart from himself. Nothing in any way causes God. He just he doesn't receive mm -hmm. any influx of being from anything apart from himself. And that just is going to, I think, follow strictly from these metaphysical demonstrations of God. Emotions are tricky because the way that emotions are understood classically were tied uh, – with with bodiliness right mm -hmm. and so if you think that god is holy and material then these sort of bodily aspects are just not going to apply to god and there's there's de debate about that right um, yeah but that's it's important to understand like why you know traditional theists say these things about god and there's a principled basis of why they are attributed to god when you understand it from that perspective it actually makes a lot of sense yeah mm -hmm. i agree i think it's just something that's hard to grasp but i also think changing our perspective to classical theism actually has very important implications on the spiritual life. I'd be curious your, your thoughts on this a bit. So I think that having this very materialist, this essentially almost a naturalism plus God view, which I think a lot yeah. of people have nowadays. Yeah. And then sort of God is almost thought of as in naturalistic terms. A lot of the traditional approach to the spiritual life doesn't make much sense. So I think one big example of this is fasting nowadays, right? Why have we cut down on the requirements for fasting so much in the modern church? It's because we often think of fasting nowadays, I think, in sort of legalistic terms. We're trying to follow some set of rules the church set up, maybe to help discipline ourselves a bit, yeah. rather than what I might take as the more traditional approach is we start with this idea of beatitude, that God created all things, he is infinitely good, and so he can fulfill any of our desires that we have through natural things. And so actually we're giving up the natural world, things in the natural world to actually attain those joys instead in God, instead of in natural things. Yeah, that's beautiful. So let me see if I can think through this with you. Cause I think there are, you know, we've been kind of treading some of the uh, spooky aspects of classical theism. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't like, I like spooky stuff, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, the main reason that I'm a classical theist is I just don't think anything else is going to cut it, right? Uh, yeah. So I, I think, and not like intellectually and spiritually. So I'll give you a few examples. One, I think if you're, if you're committed to the complete intelligibility of reality, it's simplicity or bust, right? I think if you wind up with some sort of complexity at the root where the, the nature of the constituents doesn't demand, uh, you know, their unity or what have you, which I've never seen an account of why that would be the case. Then you just have, you're stuck with brute facts, right? And in fact, mm. this is, this is what skeptics will often press against theists. They'll say, okay, yeah, I have brute facts, but you have brute facts too. And I think against many theists who are like complex theists, they do, they don't have an account of why God has being or the character or particular attributes mm -hmm. he does. The classical theist doesn't have to explain the unity of God's parts because he doesn't have any parts. That question mm -hmm. isn't even coherently asked of the classical theist, right? There are questions that can be asked of, of the classical theist, but uh, I think there's good answers to them. Like, how are you saying that knowledge and power are identical in God, that these, these are like, they seem like numerically distinct attributes. And this is where the principle of analogy comes in, right? We're not mm -hmm. saying that not knowledge and power as we understand it are identical in God. We're saying something like knowledge and something like power are identical in God. The, the way I like to explain this is that is through a notion of a limit case. And the very, very briefly, uh, just think of, um, think of a series of, of polygons, right? An ordered series of polygons with increasing number of sides and angles being ordered towards a circle, right? So a circle is the limit case instance towards which that series is pointing, but it's not itself a member of that series, right? Or think mm -hmm. of decreasing speeds that are converging towards what? A standstill. A standstill is not itself a speed, uh, but it's clear that that's what that series is converging towards. So there's a real similarity, a real similarity. It's not arbitrary between a limit case and the ordered series, but the limit case is not itself a member of that series, right? And if you understand this in terms of how we make attributions of God or the sort of effect to cause reasoning we go uh, use to God, what we're saying with divine simplicity is not that like as knowledge and power as we understand it or experience is identical to God. What we're saying is the limit case instance of power is identical to the limit case instance of knowledge as, as mm -hmm. these pure perfections. And there's no reason to think that those can't be identical, right? So again, yeah. these, these conceptual clarifications, I think, can go a long way to diffusing... Uh, a lot of common objections. So ultimate intelligibility, 
ultimate goodness, right? Goodness, if you're a classical theist, again, the limit case instance of, of, of goodness or the good itself is not grounded in something. The good mm. is ungrounded, right? Goodness is, yeah. is, is, is primary and fundamental for the classical theist. So you don't have these concerns of like arbitrary divine command ethics or Euthyphro's dilemma or any of that with the classical theist. Mm. Like the good is truly primary, but the good is also existence alone, right? Uh, yeah. Classical theist, right? These are huge advantages for metaphysics, for meta ethics, I also think meta epistemology too, right? Because you have to have like with God, God is is intellection itself, knowledge itself, truth itself, whatever God's mode of knowledge is. It doesn't seem susceptible to uh, representational knowledge or propositional knowledge. All these things that seem to invite skeptical scenarios, they don't apply to God, right? Yeah. Um, so that's an interesting implication for meta epistemology as well. That seems to be quite positive. So I think across all like areas of philosophy, classical theism has decisive advantages for how it can answer questions that non-classical theists and naturalists cannot answer. And then in the spiritual life, uh, man, like seeking union with the good itself, with being itself, as opposed to some like just like souped up demiurge, uh, that that makes all the difference for me. Like, mm -hmm. I, like creatureliness is inadequate. It is completely yeah. inadequate. It's inadequate philosophically. It's inadequate spiritually and theologically. Like if what you're yeah. giving me is just souped up creatureliness, I, I, I can't do it, man. I can't sign on for it. I would have, I'd never, I'm, I mean, I'm a former naturalist, right? And yeah. part of the reason that I rejected theism is because I had a creaturely understanding of God in very similar ways of what these complex theists still endorse today. So what, yeah, yeah simplicity in classical theism is hugely motivating for me, it, not just philosophically, but absolutely in the spiritual life as well, right? No, I think so. And if there's any priests watching this, please give sermons on this topic because so much of like the Catholic lady nowadays do not know about any of this stuff. And I think it's so foundational to our faith, to the spiritual life, to everything. Now do it in a way that's comprehensible. You know, I was once at a mass with a Dominican priest and he started trying to explain what ipsum esse subsistence means to like people like, no, that's not the way to do it. This is, you don't need to show off your seminary education to people. They, you all, you lost them as soon as you brought in any Latin words. You know, I think a good example of how you can explain these things in a meditative way is something like St. Anselm's Proslogion, actually. Everyone focuses on the part about the ontological argument, but there's a lot of parts that are really just devotional His prayers, meditations right. on divine simplicity. Yeah, there, there is a great part where he's talking, this is near the beginning, where he's talking about the issue of omnipresence. Because God is so utterly actual, he's absolutely everywhere. But he's also so utterly actual that he's beyond what can be seen anywhere. And that's why we look around and we don't see God, even though we should see God everywhere. And just meditating on that mystery, the fact that we should simultaneously see and not see God in everything we see. Yeah. Uh, or another part where he's, you know, his whole argument is God is that than which nothing greater can be thought. And then he concludes and says, but actually God is greater than that can, which can be thought. You know, and there's all sorts of great parts in that where he's just meditating on these things. And I think actually could be brought to the average person in a way that could actually be beneficial to their spiritual life. I think so. I think it can, I think it can always stand to help. And again, with, with classical theists, right. We, we hold a, a doctrine of, of participation, right. Where we mm -hmm. are, we we're deeply dependent, right. We are deeply dependent beings, right. It's not like we don't have any ounce or moment of being that isn't, you know, there because it is being immediately imparted to us by that mm -hmm. that ultimate source and, and foundation that just is being itself, right? Yeah. Uh, so that speaks to that sort of omnipresence and right, God being you know closer to us than anything could possibly be, right? And that oh. is there's a uh, I think a, a, an incredibly wonderful and beautiful a mystical quality to that, or invitation, if you will, or opportunities for meditation, yeah. all that all that stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing I found helpful for grasping this was really understanding Thomas's argument. And Scott disagrees with him on this, mm -hmm. that you can't prove that the world had a beginning by natural reason. Mm -hmm. um, you're not talking here about a scientific demonstration, but mm -hmm. a metaphysical one, you know? Yeah. And I think that once you grasp that, then you realize, oh, God's, but also Thomas says you can prove that God created by natural reason. Scotus says the same thing. Yep. And so if you can prove that God created out of nothing, but could have created out of nothing an eternal world, then you start understanding creation as something God is doing out genuinely outside of time. And then you realize that same relationship still applies in the world that we now exist in with time.
Yeah. And that's, I think that's beautiful. I think it's, it's worth just like retreading some of that thought because I mean, for me, this was such a, a profound shift in how I understood God and the world. So the idea is like, God is not a horizontal cause, right? He's not somebody that just flicks that first domino, whatever that is, and then kind of mm -hmm. steps back to more seemly recreations. Like you, like you said, you know, Aquinas was totally willing to countenance that maybe those dominoes go back for past eternal, right? Maybe there's no mm -hmm. first flicker in that sort of causal series, right? But in a more vertical causal series, call it a hierarchical causal series and essentially ordered causal series, whatever you want in the order of being mm -hmm. concerning creatures like us, whose essence does not guarantee our existence, right? There's that real distinction thesis between our essence and existence, right? It's just going to be the case that we could never exist for an instant, right? Unless there's that fundamental ground, the sort of the metaphysical cause, you might say, right? Uh, whose essence just is pure existence that brings everything uh, forth from nothing. And that ties nicely into the idea of a limit case, right? So if you think of things that are powerful, you might think that things are powerful, like increasingly to the extent that they can do more with less. Well, maybe the limit case is like the thing that can just produce without having to work on any material at all. Right. Yeah. And that's God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think so important here is actually the inclusion of metaphysics as part of philosophy. I think we tend to limit metaphysics and it's often to religious discussion, at least in the popular discourse, you know, but if we can make, but we have sort of two degrees of abstraction that we tend to work with nowadays. We have our, we have sort of science. We're making one degree of abstraction. Then we're looking at the mathematical patterns and things. We're making a second degree. And we're asking, you need to make one more degree of abstraction to just the being of things and their existence. And once you have that, then I think you realize that almost the immaterial and the material are almost on the same playing field once we're at this degree of abstraction. Now we're talking about just being in general. And so now it's not so absurd that infinite being could create some sort of finite being out of nothing genuinely. Yeah, that's that, that's totally right. Like the way that um, like contemporary philosophy thinks of like mind and matter is just very foreign to like how the Aristotelian or Thomas thinks of matter as mm -hmm. just a, as a limiting principle, right? Yeah. And it's nothing I think too difficult about thinking how something is you know, qualitatively unlimited can produce limited things, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so yeah. we're hitting about an hour here. So you want to jump over to your channel? Yeah. So thanks for this interview. I appreciate it. If people want more, we're going to kind of swap roles here and I'm going to have a chat with Gideon about uh, his thoughts on divine providence. So cheers, everybody. All right. Thank you. Thank you everyone for watching and to keep watching, check out the link in the description.